All right. Okay. So it's it's my pleasure today to present this overview of the first 100 years of Alpena cement industry. And I have titled it, in keeping with today's theme, uh, Sparking Innovation on Thunder Bay's Shores for Over a Century. Uh, a little bit about my background, Don mentioned some of that. Uh, our family lived in Alpena from 2000, excuse me, from 1997 to 2007. And during that time, I was serving as the director of facilities for the Alpena Regional Medical Center. And during that time, I became very interested in local history and became involved with the Thunder Bay Island Preservation Society uh, in various capacities, serving as president and historian and writing a book about that island titled Lanterns and Lifeboats, which I will promote here. Uh, shortly after Lanterns and Lifeboats was published, I was approached by Lafarge to write a commemorative 100th anniversary history of the Alpena cement industry. I'd been looking out uh, on Thunder Bay, out towards the island for a number of years on that project, and then suddenly turned it 180 degrees. And uh, the cement plant, which those of you who sail and boat and fish out in Thunder Bay, you know that is definitely the predominant uh, landmark uh, as you approach uh, Alpena. So this presentation is based on that book, which was published in 2007 under the title, A Century of Cement, A Legacy of Progress. This uh, included material from a previous book called The Huron Heritage by George Stark. So I was able to capture George's research that he had done back in 1957 and his publication. Uh, he was a, a Detroit newspaper man and wrote uh, a 50th an commemorative anniversary book on the history of Huron Portland cement. I took his book, his original book, and basically edited it and then added the material to cover the next 50 years through 2007. Shortly after the book was published, I took a new job in facilities for Munson Medical Center in Traverse City, and I retired from Munson in 2020. And since then, my wife, Amy, and I have been serving in the area of camp ministries, various uh, camps over uh, the past three years in Washington, Montana, and now we are based in Colorado, where we are working with Young Life Ministries at their Frontier Ranch Camp in Buena Vista, Colorado. So today I will break my presentation into three main parts covering the 100 years of history. Uh, the first five decades includes the original founding of the Huron Portland Cement Company in 1907, and that period concludes in 1959 when Huron Portland Cement was sold to National Gypsum. The next part will cover the roughly 25 years of National Gypsum operations, and that concluded with the acquisition by Lafarge in 1986. And then my presentation ends in 2007 when this book was published. Obviously, there's been a lot more recent history and development since Lafarge uh, merged with Oak Holcomb Group in 2014, but I will be focusing my attention on those first 100 years. So let's talk about the manufacturing of cement, a little bit of the history behind what is going on there on the shores of Thunder Bay. Manufacturing cement is relatively new technology in the span of history. The first cement mill uh, came to America in 1872. And even though there's evidence of some very early predecessors of modern Portland cement that go back as far as ancient Egypt, Africa, South America, and Rome, the cement that we use today, the modern type of cement really developed in England in the late 1700s to early 1800s. In 1824, a patent was granted to Joseph Aston for what today is known as Portland cement, so named after its resemblance to limestone that came from the island of Portland off the coast of England. The first U.S. patent came in 1871 to David Saylor in Pennsylvania, as I mentioned earlier, the first cement mill opened in 1872 in Pennsylvania. And by the 1890s, cement production had sprung up in 16 different locations in the United States. In 1903, the Wyandotte Portland Cement Company was started as a way to dispose of byproducts from the Michigan Alkali Company. Michigan Alkali, which, is located, which was located in downriver Detroit 
in Wyandotte, manufactured the raw materials for the glass industry and had a large amount of byproduct called soda ash that it needed to dispose of. It turns out that soda ash is a great raw material for producing cement. By 1906, the company was contemplating an expansion of its cement production in Alpena, which had the advantage of access to substantial quantity and quality of limestone and shale at its nearby quarries. In 1907, the Huron Portland Cement Company was incorporated with its headquarters at the Majestic Building in downtown Detroit. John B. Ford, pictured here, grandson of the founder of Pittsburgh Plate Glass, PPG, and who had come up through management in the family's glass manufacturing business, became Huron Portland Cement's first president. The original plant was constructed with six kilns. This time, concrete was becoming extremely popular building material, both for roads and for reinforced concrete buildings, which was a new technology as well. Road construction in particular was propelled by the growth of the auto industry with a Model T Ford coming on the market in 1908. And I should just mention on the side here that the Fords of the Pittsburgh Plate Glass and uh, here in Portland Cement family were no relation to the Henry Ford family, um, although they obviously had a major impact uh, in the industry in the Midwest as the, as the Ford family. So let's talk about the cement manufacturing process. Cement is manufactured, and I took this as a quote from the Portland Cement Company, or Portland Cement Association, as a closely controlled chemical combination of calcium, silicon, aluminum, iron, and other ingredients, unquote. And how this plays itself out in Alpena is really three main raw ingredients that were brought to the plant. Two of those ingredients were mined locally, which was the limestone from the Alpena quarry and the shale from the Paxton quarry, which is west of Alpena, a few miles on the, uh, uh, would be the south side of M32, you, you pass it, the old shale quarry there. And then the gypsum was brought up lake from the Alabaster Quarry, which is also located on Lake Huron um, in the town of Alabaster. I should mention in recent years, the shale has been replaced with other products or other raw materials such as taconite, fly ash, and sand. Uh, that change happened uh, when Lafarge took over. Raw ingredients, the limestone, the shale, and gypsum are crushed, milled, proportioned and heated, and then ground in a finished product we use as cement. So it starts out, and this is the some photos from the Alpena uh, limestone quarry. Steve, you're there. I think we're losing you a bit. Oh, yeah. All right. Sorry about that. So this shows the uh, raw rocks coming in and crushed and ultimately mixed at a four to one ratio, four parts limestone to one part uh, shale, and then ground into a fine powder by these steel ball mills that you see. And these are just basically huge industrial size rock tumblers, if you can think about it that way. The mixture, which was known as raw mix, was then fed into the giant rotary uh, kilns, cement kilns. And this was really where the chemical process takes place, heating up to 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit, and then discharging a product called cement clinker, which are hard granular balls, greenish black in color, about the size of marbles. This clinker was then crushed and, it, and then ad, added with gypsum from the nearby alabaster quarry, and then a final grinding taking place to create the finished Portland cement product. You'll see the photo here uh, on the left is actually uh, the inside of one of those kilns. And from time to time, they had to go in and 
remove this buildup that you see. And a lot, a lot of the workers that I spoke to uh, said uh, when I interviewed said this was their least favorite uh, job. And uh, as you can imagine, here's some photos of the power plant. So the plant has significant need for electric power. And this was primarily generated by coal fired steam engines although they would also preheat the steam using excess heat left over from the kiln process. For the first decade, the cement was dispensed into bags that you see here and then loaded by hand onto ships. But in 1916, a major breakthrough occurred when the first bulk cement carrier, which was a converted ore boat, was put into service. This was the steamer Sam Mitchell that you can see here. And by the 1920s, cement boats facilitated the development of an extensive distribution network around the Great Lakes. In the 1930s, there was distribution centers in Detroit, Duluth, Milwaukee, Buffalo, Toledo, Oswego, and Saginaw. And as the network grew, so did the need for ships. And in the 1920s, the steamers John Boardman, later renamed the Harriman, and the S.T. Crapo were added to the fleet. And I mentioned this distribution system in particular because it figures very importantly in the future of the plant and the sustainability of the plant. It was not just what was going on in Alpena, but it was this distribution network that the Great Lakes facilitated and the shipping industry facilitated that really kept um, things uh, going very strong. Now, the Great Depression affected cement production as it did our entire economy, and a significant decline was the result. But after World War II, there was a tremendous rebound, and this ramped up further expansion at the Alpena plant. During the next decade, 12 more kilns were put into service, and at its peak, there were 23 kilns in operation. Production had basically quadrupled at this point, and during this era, Emery M. Ford, the nephew of John B. Ford, the founder, was taking, took the helm. At this time, the key success factors for the company, as I mentioned, were the high quality of limestone and shale available in Alpena, plus the low cost water transportation network that Huron Portland Cement had established. With increased production and demand, the distribution network grew similarly. And by the 1950s, Muskegon, Green Bay, Superior, and St. Joe were added as distribution centers. More distribution centers meant more ships. So there were a, Others put into service, including the Paul H. Townsend, 1951, the E.M. Ford, 1955, and the J.B. Ford in 1956. The limestone operation was also expanded at this time, and here on Portland Cement acquired the neighboring Thunder Bay Quarry. The quarry was now over a mile and a half wide and nearly 200 feet deep. In the 1940s, union organization at here in Portland Cement started up. And by 1948, all hourly workers were represented by the United Stone and Allied Product Workers of America Local 135. At this stage, Huron Portland Cement Company began facing challenges on a number of fronts. In 1953, Paul H. Townsend took over as president, and then labor unrest in the form of a quarry worker strike occurred in 1957. Finally, in 1959, it was decided to sell the company to National Gypsum for $67 million. This ended three generations of the Ford family ownership. The next 25 years of ownership by National Gypsum would be focused on plant modernization, wrestling with environmental regulations, and continued labor relations challenges. H. Ripley Shem took the helm as president and CEO, his first step to increase production with a 15-year $72 million master plan, which brought new kilns, grinders, product storage, and a vessel loading system. The goal was to double production capacity. This came on the heels of demand that was created by a $100 billion national interstate highway building program, courtesy of the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956. But by 1961, the plans were tempered with the reality that the U.S cement making capacity in the US was actually overbuilt, overbuilt for the demand and the expansion and large workforce at here in Portland Cement of over 2000 was looking more like a liability than an asset. 
Still, they pushed forward with the expansion and even added another ship to the fleet, the H.R. Shem, which was renamed the Eagle Heart in 1965. As the environmental movement began in the late 1960s and early 70s, pressure came from the Michigan Air Pollution Control Commission to implement a dust elimination plan. Cement dust had been an ongoing issue in the vicinity of the plant. In fact, the classifieds in the Alpena News included used car advertisements for cement plant specials, which were cars that were discounted based on the damage caused by cement dust. Some of the older cement plant equipment, which were the biggest culprits when it came to dust, were shut down. But there was still a long way to go to meet the requirements. And the pinch points of labor cost increases plus demand decreases led National Gypsum to initially propose a nine-year pollution control implementation plan. This was too long a time frame for Lansing to approve. And after some back and forth, they approved a six-year plan with the requirement of a one-third pollution reduction in the first year. The first phase of that plan was mostly low-hanging fruit, shutting down old equipment. But by 1973, new economic challenges were slowing down the implementation, and management decided it needed to look at labor savings to pay for this next phase. This would require a $30 million kiln replacement. Organized labor was not enthusiastic at all, and tensions rose with a lockout by the company to pressure the union to agree to the company's latest contract proposal. The lockout went on for weeks until a deal was struck whereby National Gypsum committed to capital improvements that would ensure preservation of jobs, and then the union would agree to the contract, ending a nearly two-month work stoppage. By the early 1980s, with an economic recession and oversupply of cement nationwide, National Gypsum decided it was time to divest its cement division. There were some interested parties, but no takers. Meanwhile, economic losses were cut via layoffs, shutting down kilns, and laying up half of the fleet of ships. In 1986, Lafarge stepped in and purchased the cement division for $23 million one-third of what National Gypsum had paid for 25 years earlier. At that time, the cement operation was Alpena's largest taxpayer, generating $1.5 million of tax revenue, or 20% of the city's tax base. Interestingly, Lafarge was mostly interested in acquiring the extensive cement distribution system that I mentioned earlier around the Great Lakes, this came with the purchase, and it was not even certain that Lafarge would continue to operate the cement plant itself. But ultimately, Lafarge chose to reopen the plant at a smaller scale, however, about half the size that it had run under National Gypsum at its peak. Management had used this plant shutdown prior to the purchase to its advantage, and contracts with its steelworkers union were voided. The plan was to reopen the plant with just four kilns and just 300 workers. There were 3,000 applicants for those 300 jobs. In 1988, Lafarge announced it would invest nearly 70 million in modernizing the plant. And over the next six years, there was replacement of grinders, mills, crushers, as well as a new power plant. Lafarge also touted its focus on worker safety, fewer layers of management, bonus plan, more training, and flexible job descriptions. But meeting the dust reduction goals did not absolve the plant of all of its environmental problems. And in the 1990s, when the plant began to utilize waste-derived fuel, as it was known, for heating its largest kilns, this fuel was waste byproducts for manufacturing that include solvents like paint thinner, waste oil, etc. This became a lightning rod for local environmentalists especially as Lafarge proposed expanding this to all of its kilns. The Huron Environmental Activist League stepped up to oppose Lafarge's permit with the DEQ, which became actually national news featured in the New York Times. While ultimately the DEQ could not find a sufficient reason to withhold its permit to Lafarge, Lafarge chose to voluntarily quit the practice in 2001. Similarly, in the late 1990s, the DNR raised concerns about an 80-acre pile of cement kiln dust, which was a legacy of the National Gypsum era. 
and this threatened the waters of Thunder Bay with contamination from leaching out. National Gypsum was engaged to address the problem and built a $2 million barrier seawall to prevent surface and subsurface migration of the contaminants. After that time frame, cement kiln dust had been landfilled at the quarry. Another milestone in the 90s was the closing of the Paxton Quarry, which had supplied the plant with shale for 90 years. In its stead, fly ash, which was a waste byproduct from Canadian power plants, and taconite from Upper Peninsula iron mines provided the silica, aluminum, and iron that had previously been used or provided by the shale. Lafarge partnered with government and conservation groups to restore the old Paxton shale quarry to the wildlife habitat that it is today. A new clinker storage building, the largest of its kind in the world, was erected in 1998. And in the end, over its first decade of operating the plant, Lafarge had invested $140 million in improvements, not only addressing environmental concerns, but increasing its capacity by nearly 60%. Ultimately, the plant reached production on par with previous levels from the 1970s. And by the 30-year mark, which coincided with the plant's 100th anniversary, the company had completed over $250 million in improvements. At that time, there were 250 employees, which is about one-tenth of the number of its peak in the 1950s. Another change brought out by the Lafarge acquisition was the spinoff of the Huron Bulk Carrier Shipping Fleet. The Jones Act required that shipping within U.S. waters needed to be done by a U.S. carrier, which was not possible for Lafarge, a French-owned company. So Inland Lakes Management was formed and assumed ownership of the fleet of cement boats. Transport then was shifted from the older fleet to the newer ships. This included the Iglehart and the former Leon Fraser, which was acquired and renamed the Alpina in 1990. At this time, they added two new articulated tug barges, Integrity in 1996, and the Innovation a decade later. These tug barges ultimately made the old fleet obsolete, and subsequently the six old ships, Mitchell, Harriman, E.M. Ford, Paul Townsend, J.B. Ford, and S.T. Crapo, were retired, sold off, converted to storage barges, and finally, all of them have been scrapped. Of the retired ships, only the Eaglehart has escaped this torch, still serving as a storage barge in Superior, Wisconsin. And now, at least the Alpina and the two integrated tug barges carry nearly as much cement as the previous seven retired ships combined. In keeping with our theme today, Spark, Places of Innovation, it is fitting to reflect on unique technological innovation that occurred at the Alpena plant. While it could be argued that the primary focus of the Alpena plant's owners has been on increasing production through expansion, there is one particular innovation that did come into being through a collaboration between the Alpena plant and the Fuller Company, a mining equipment manufacturer. In 1945, they partnered to develop the air slide, a new and efficient method using a cushion of air to rapidly transport ground materials from point to point in a manufacturing process by fluidizing that with the air flow and using gravity. This is still widely used today in many industries. I'd like to kind of conclude the formal part of the presentation with just some personal reflections that I was able to get from former workers at the plant. I'm gonna actually read a little bit from the book itself and I'm turning to the chapter titled Recollections from the Past 50 Years. In 1956, the writers of the Huron Heritage interviewed a group of retirees to get firsthand accounts of the early years of Huron Portland Cement Company. I decided it was only fitting that we did the same thing at the 100th anniversary and interviewed 12 former employees. There were common themes to these conversations. For starters, all commented on the tremendous technical advances over the 50 years. In particular was the automation of the plant 
and dramatic decrease in dust emissions. The automation took a lot of the guesswork out of the most critical job, which was operating the burners of the kilns. One of the retirees, Ken Reynolds, recalled that, quote, some burner operators were good, some were not so good. And when things were not good, it meant we would be using ham sledgehammers to break up clinker that had not come out the proper size. The problem of kiln back ring formation due to too much back pressure was also eliminated with this automation. Many also mentioned the variety of assignments they had during the course of their career. Most of the retirees said they began by pushing a broom, a common entry level duty. This was simply keeping sweep up the large quantities of cement dust that coated all the buildings and equipment, but was critical for the smooth operation of the plant. Another entry-level job was to work in kiln room number one, the oldest portion of the plant. These were the original kilns fed by hoppers. The environment was dirty, hot, and dangerous, and occasionally fires would break out from problems with coal feed. It was described by some of the retirees as the closest thing to hell on earth, and they most looked forward to the day they could sign a posting and get out of there. The other job nobody liked was changing the separators. Some of the retirees I interviewed included Jerry Rosnowski. He spent 16 years working atop the number four storage silo where he could watch sunrises, sunsets, and storms from a vantage point 150 feet above Thunder Bay. He also enjoyed technical challenges of balancing the large fans and keeping rotating equipment properly tuned. He said, quote, I learned that every problem in machinery is either caused by being out of balance or out of alignment. He said, he added his own personal view. He thought this was a good rule of thumb for people too. Robert Ellery recalled the early days prior to dust control when, as I mentioned earlier, the cement plant specials proliferated. Workers would use vinegar or even acid at times to clean the windshield so they could drive home at the end of the day. As a burner, he was responsible for controlling the two critical variables for clinker formation, the speed of the kiln and the temperature via the coal feed. <clears throat> he explained that the fire itself regulated the movement of the raw material through the kiln. So as a burner, he was constantly watching to make sure that the feed was not coming too fast. <clears throat> Kilns were shut down according to Robert, for minor maintenance about every six months and for major maintenance about every 18 months. Ellery spoke of the self-sufficiency of the Alpena plant as compared to others. He noticed that they noted that they generated their own electric power, mined their own quarry, and had a full complement of skills at the plant to maintain. Michael Wisniewski was another burner operator he explained that the raw materials looked like, quote, water splashing in the heart of the 2,700 degree burning zone. He was the first operator in the new control room that was installed. Teddy Lee Hoe recalled his years as a mason and the challenge that they had of bricking the kilns. Bricking rings were used to hold the brick in place, he said, until you reached the top where the key brick was installed. Steel plates were driven to snug up the entire assembly. The biggest challenge at times was peeling off the cement coating inside the kiln, which could get up to 24 inches thick. For many, if not most employees, working at the cement plant was a privilege that was passed down from generation to generation. Many had fathers that had worked there. Some had children that also followed in their footsteps. Darwin Hart Hartman had a father and three brothers there at one time. He worked during his career as a kiln burner, dust truck and dozer operator, and foreman in the repair and sheet metal departments. Don Kane, who started the plant in 1951, was one of the few who had worked under all three owners here in Portland Cement, National Gypsum, and Lafarge. He said, as we're uh, describing his work in the dryer operation, that he would have nightmares about fall and winter when material got wet, turned to mud, or froze in the hoppers. We used every possible means, he said, 
air hoses, propane torches, sledgehammers to keep it moving. We were under a lot of pressure to not slow down production. Robert Keene came from a line of cement plant workers. His dad worked at the plant, and after four years in the Air Force, Bob followed in his footsteps, starting out in raw grind and moving on to be supervisor of the infamous number one kiln room until it was shut down in 1960. He said, quote, there were a lot of good days, some bad days, but nothing like a boring day, he summed it up. He also paid tribute to a legacy of constant improvement and innovation. He said, quote, during my 38 years, we went from Barney Rubble to Star Wars. <clears throat> Bonnie and Jerry Gujan were one of several husband and wife teams at the plant. Jerry, as a repairman, spent much of his time in the never-ending battle with cement dust and the toll it took on equipment. The interesting thing, he said, was that the finer material was actually more damaging. For instance, a crusher, which broke huge boulders into six inches, would only need to be repaired every few years. But the fine cement powder could wear away an inch of metal in a week. He was particularly pleased with the dust collecting systems that came along. Their daughter, Jennifer, like many college kids, spent their summer working at the plant. According to Jennifer, the pay was great. Jerry and Bonnie remarked how hard the kids worked. They were amazed to see their daughter running a jackhammer. Bonnie Gujan worked as a clerk and secretary and ultimately became secretary to the division superintendent. So in conclusion, I hope this has given you an appreciation for Alpina's historic contribution to the advancement of cement technology. It's a history that's still being written clearly with further economic and environmental advances as well as challenges which face the global $325 billion cement industry. As I said, this is just an interview, a overview, but if it's whetted your appetite, I certainly encourage you to pick up a copy of the cement, Century of Cement book, which I believe is available at the Alpena Library or also through other aspects of the Michigan yeah, MEL system through interlibrary loan. Also mentioning again, Lanterns and Lifeboats, which I believe the Thunder Bay Island Preservation Society still sells in which the proceeds have gone to restoring the lighthouse at Thunder Bay Island. And that concludes my uh, slides and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have again. <clears throat>